Welcome to the Power Within Podcast. I'm your host, Lori, and today I'm super honored and inspired to have Elise Hummel on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here, Elise. This is such an honor for me. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We always have great conversations, so I'm looking forward to it. We do. And you have so much going on. Um, you know, I when I first got introduced to you right away, I loved your you have such a bubbly and welcoming, like it's almost like a, a safe feeling people have when they get to interact with you. And you have you always been that way, that kind of bubbly person who's just very open and creative and or is there something did that like spark later in your life? I have not always been this person. And in fact, there was many years of my life where I had so much pain inside that I was projecting to the outer world that I was constantly in conflict. And that was extremely difficult for me. And it came from a lot of trauma in my childhood. And me working through all of those layers and pieces of myself and doing a lot of self work, that allows me to be in a space where I am very vulnerable with the rest of the world and very authentic. And it's a safe space for other people because I'm a safe space for me. I know myself well, and I don't, and I'm not projecting that pain anymore onto other people. I'm coming from a place of love and understanding and compassion for that past version of myself who went through all of those experiences. And so therefore I'm in that in the now, and I'm able to hold that space for other people. And I I was always really I would say a big character when I was young, before my father passed away, I, w I was in pageants. I was, I was a national athlete. I was in Miss USA when I was age eight. So I was always on the stage, very loud. And I like to dance a lot. I like to do things with my hands, very talkative. Um, but like I said, there was things that happened in my life that dimmed that spirit within myself and stopped me from expressing my emotions and expressing myself. And the more that I put on a mask for the world and thought that I had to behave in certain ways, the more that my pain continued to build and the less that I would do things that I really enjoyed, which now is, is definitely the creative arts, which is expressing myself and being authentically me. And I, you just actually touched on a whole bunch of points that I want to talk about. So I'm going to go back a little bit first. So you talked about when you were younger and you used to do pageants and you love to be on stage and dancing. And one of the things that I loved about like getting to know you is that you do have that fun, bubbly personality of that, like dance and have fun and be creative. And I used to be such a serious person. And so I was like, I'm I'm too old for that. And you really got me to experience that myself. So I'm really grateful for that. Now, when you were younger, I know you did say that you like to dance and stuff. And you're really great with paints and resins. Uh, I know you're learning the, the resins now. Um, did you use like those artistic abilities when you were younger going through things? Or was it more just like the dance and being loud? Honestly, it was it was um, I was an athlete. And I was in choir, so I, w I sang a lot. Um, I was on a nationally competing and ranked uh, cheer team. I was always like the leader of everything. So I was like the leader of the cheer squad. And I always really liked that position. And I liked being a speaker. So I was in pageants. We had to learn how to public speak as well. Um, but dance was a huge part of my life. Even with um, being an athlete, I was doing um, pole vaulting as a teenager after I stopped with kind of like the more the more what I see as like feminine movement and embodiment but I was very in tune with I would say my body my mom was like the artist my mom is somebody she has murals all over her house she doesn't even think of them as murals she's just like oh that tree like she but she could make anything out of anything and I think the fact that she was a Leo so my mom is very she knows herself and she she's very expressive I would say because I had kind of an idea of what an artist looked like, like how they did certain things. I never thought that my what I made was like good enough, like because my what my mom made was amazing. Even when it comes to resin now, my mom for my 31st birthday or 30th birthday, she made me this tiny little container with all these little elements and each one of them meant something and they were resin. And that's how she told the story of me. And she makes these like little keychain necklaces. She's been using resin for years. 
So I think I internalized an idea of what an artist looked like through me watching my mom who had an entire art room in our basement, which was huge. And she was constantly using it. She, um, you know, maybe a few years back, she worked at a thrift store and she even had an online album of things that you can make for under $5. And she was so creative that she could just make anything out of anything. She even made my pageant dresses when I was young. All of my, like my clothes that were important, they were made by my mom and they had little details on them. So I think I had a limiting concept of what it meant to be an artist, what it meant to be, um, I guess, creative based on my idea of like my creations weren't as good as my mom's. Yeah. And so um, when you were talking about like, uh, first of all, I love that your mom is creative because I think that that's amazing, especially with kids around, because I think in the world today, especially, you know, getting kids involved with that creative outlet is so important. So I, I love that you had that growing up around you. And uh, then you talked about your, your pageants again. And I know later in, in your life, you also did some modeling. So was that kind of your leeway into wanting to do that? Or did that come about a different way for you? Oh, my gosh. So I... <laughs> I was in pageants until from three years old, I started pageants. My parents knew very quickly that I wanted to be in front of a camera and be very expressive. And I also love costume. Um, I was in pageants until my dad passed away because they're expensive. And I always wanted to be the best at things that I could travel with because my dad was gone a lot. So I see this as why I was like a national competitor in things because I wanted my dad's attention and approval and then he would need to be there. So I was even more competitive than my brothers. So for me, when it came to pageants, my mom wanted kind of like like a doll, you know, like the dress up, like look good, that kind of thing. So I had ideas about what I was supposed to look like as a, as a woman, as a girl, how I was supposed to hold myself with grace and all these ideas. And I rebelled against those for many years. So after my dad passed away, I was like, this is not who I am. Like, I want to be something different. I want to play with the boys. My brothers got the year I went to Miss USA, my brothers got dirt bikes. And I was so mad because I was like, I wanted a dirt bike. I remember I got diamond earrings one year for Christmas and they got a, the, a new four wheeler. And I was like, what do I do with diamond earrings? Like I'm 10 years old. So like <laughs> these ideas that I had about women and, and little girls, like I rebelled against that. And when I became an adult, I did work as a full-time model. I've worked with many, many large brands. Primarily, I've worked with brands that are um, I, Harley Davidson, Progressive Bike Insurance. You know, I've, I've worked for many large companies now, and I fell into that through um, my dad's spirit. And that's because I, I moved down here. I had just gotten a divorce. I didn't know anybody. And I wanted to celebrate my dad's passing. Well, celebrate my dad's life. It was his birthday. And, and so my dad passed away on a motorcycle. And so I went to the Harley Davidson dealership and I was like, Hey, you know, I'd like to get my license on this day. Um, can you add me? And they were like, Oh, it's only for employees. And I was like, well, I'm just one person would it be okay. So they said, yes. And then on the first day I look around and there's all these very young, very attractive women. And they all keep saying, Harley girl, Harley girl. Well, my first tattoo when I was younger, which is also my very first experience of using alchemy. So turning pain into this, um, like how I use it now through art and through symbolism, I got eagle wings, screaming eagle wings on the back of my neck for my dad. And they say on the wings of an angel with his initials. And I was like, yeah, Harley girl. I'm a Harley girl. I grew up on Harleys. I didn't know it was, they were models. So then the final day came and they were like, hey, we are doing the photo shoot. Everyone be ready tomorrow. And I was like, wait, what photo shoot? Like, why are we doing a photo shoot? I'm here to ride motorcycles. You know, I grew up on motorcycles so that I was just there to do that and to remember my dad. And um, they were like, oh, well, we're Harley girls. And I was like, what is a Harley girl? And they were like, we're models for Harley Davidson. And I was like, that's a job. And they're like, you don't have that job because I was heavily tattooed, Harley Davidson included. That was my first one. So they were looking at me like we thought that you were the main girl. And I was like, I don't even know what this is. 
So I got hired to do commercials in the area. And then I started working, you know, events. That's how I started working with Progressive Bike Insurance. It was the same with Progressive Bike. Like when we went to Sturges, they would put fake tattoos on the other models. So I worked with Dean Guitars after that. My I found unhappiness in full-time modeling when I did things that weren't authentically me. Like if, if I had to cover my tattoos, I remember Dr. Pepper and go RVing, I had to cover my tattoos in the Florida heat. And I started to question why I was there, what my intention was, was it making me happy? And what were the ideas that I was starting to share in that community? Because I also became a bikini competitor and that was an extreme time of unhappiness in my life. You had to compete to win money, like you weren't promised money and you were putting yourself up against other women and like breaking down each other's bodies and the, the behaviors that happened in that community only exemplified my already existing eating disorder. And then it would be perpetuated by other people saying how good I looked. And, you know, I ended up getting plastic surgery for that reason. I have breast implants. And, and so for me, that, that entire field, that entire industry, though I fell back into it after having a background in it, it wasn't guided by me wanting to be a full-time model that became kind of something for me to gain money in my master's degree and then was fun for a while and then turned not so fun, which is why I no longer take jobs within the modeling industry. And I want to, uh, this is a good segue into kind of talking about this because I, I love that you brought it up talking about the, you would like compete and like pick apart like each other's bodies and, you know, try to be that, like that competition mode. Um, I you see that a lot in the world and I and I think it's even more prevalent in the past like decade or so with social media and and all of that coming into play and people really having this um like this unrealistic expectation of what they should be what they should look like and it creates a lot of problems so first thing I want to talk to you about is that kind of um you're a very beautiful woman and you're very, very intelligent. So um, for you, was that like, I know you had mentioned earlier that you did like cheerleading stuff. So were you kind of like in the popular crowd a little bit when you were younger? And did you have that kind of competing and comparing type of thing in high school that you like a little bit that led you like where you could say, okay, I, you know, this was similar in high school, or was it on a whole different level once you got to that, you know, the, when you said you were doing like the bikini modeling, and then you had to get like breast implants and stuff. So for me, I was never like, I, I was bullied a lot. I was constantly bullied. People called me duck lips growing up. My lips are real, which now I'm looking back and I'm like, people pay for this, but they would put pictures of dead ducks on my locker. I mean, I was made fun of when I was younger. I got, I got breasts before other, other girls did. And I right away had double D's and that was it like not okay. You know, like I, people called me tissue titties, thunder thighs. Like there was this there was this behavior that existed within and myself included. I wanted to be accepted so much by other girls when it came to high school. So this is like my middle school. I'm starting to get into puberty and people are starting to notice and it is not OK. And then I get to high school and the competition that existed between um, young, young girls to look a certain way and to have that be kind of the primary focus of where their value came from, it became so clear to me. And um, I had started to develop an eating disorder as well. So then it was even more heightened for me. And I was more conscious of these things. However, like, I was not, I, I wanted to be accepted by the popular crowd so much that I did things that I would not do now. You know, I like made fun of other girls like I that competition, that behavior that did become part of how I navigated the world because I wanted to be accepted by other girls. And that was it was definitely amplified on a whole nother level as an adult. And I think it brought up um, the entire collective experience within myself. Like I'm more aware now of the ideas and beliefs that we have that are stemmed from lack of self-worth and competition and kind of this, what I call, um, 
it's like we it, the princess archetype like we grow up in these societies where it's like okay as a woman if you look a certain way then you'll get a breadwinner so put all of your value into looking a certain way but not like having the other abilities that come with being in tune with yourself as a woman and your feelings being valid, your emotions being valid, and that being a heightened um, sense of self when you're connected through everything. And so I think that that princess archetype is what's very competitive against other women, because it's like, well, I need to get a man. So I want to look better than you. And I need to look better or I need to look what society says because society is giving that standard to men to therefore be attracted to you. And so I think that that's where that idea comes from. And we grow up in a society where that is the norm. That's the standard. And I, I see the next generation having these conversations that shifting moving forward because what's happening on social media right now, you know, even with filters and, um, you know, like people are getting plastic surgery because they're they're looking at filters of themselves with you know different lips or contoured face and they're very young and i don't regret getting my breast implant surgery it was part of my journey however i feel that if i didn't have the ideas and beliefs from the culture i would have never done it because i wouldn't value it in other cultures they don't have the same rate of plastic surgery there's a reason for that we get our ideas from the culture that we are part of. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's really unrealistic. And I think that there's this kind of I'm I'm really glad that like I graduated a little bit before all this social media stuff really blew up um and and stuff because I remember like kids could be mean and they could be a little bit off, but I even now like when you go on it's very hard like when you're meeting people or or anything like um you know there's this culture of you need to look a certain way this you know especially in America everyone's really driven by celebrities and models and I want this and I want that and I you know um I'll share with, with you um you know I had in the past year I had met someone that I hit it off kind of well with and I was like oh this could potentially be like a nice relationship and I remember we got to a point and he had said to me he said I, I just want to like m kind of say to you that like I'm fine with you like looking the way they are but if you gain any more weight I, it's not going to be okay with me and I remember being like okay I, I bye bye you know like because before you know like when I before I worked on myself and did all that work that you talked about you know I used to like want to starve myself and be skinny and I would t do really unhealthy things to maintain looking a certain way and I'm like I'm very athletic you know yeah I'm, I might like my food but I'm very healthy and I'm athletic and I'm not going to be told that if I don't look a certain way, then you may not want to be with me later. And how do you think that we can make changes now to change the stigma of everyone should look a certain way? I know you mentioned like filters and maybe kind of removing that type of stuff. But how do you think that we can make some change in this? So I like what you're touching on. First of all, um, that was an amazing, I think, growth point of just being like, bye. So thank you for sharing that with me, because I think it empowers people to say, like, if somebody is telling you um, that who you are, because that's not who you are, who you are is an amazing kind spirit. So the looks aspect of it for somebody to project their insecurity onto you, it's an amazing place to put a boundary and say, this isn't for me then, because you don't see me as a whole spirit. And I want to talk about, you asked how to make changes. I think they come from being our most vulnerable and authentic self. And I think that does come down to even, you know, filters of how we speak to one another about our experience that we're having, especially as women, how we speak about what it is that we see in the world at large, how we if we use filters ourselves, if we make a conscious choice not to, because either we are consciously or subconsciously perpetuating a system. Mm -hmm. And so if we make something conscious and we say, I'm not going to do that, you're telling the universe, I'm going to be authentically myself and that's going to be beautiful and that's going to be okay. And that's where self-worth comes from. 
And so if somebody's looking at that, that's the message that they are actually receiving, whether they know that or not, their spirit knows, okay, this person fully accepts themselves and they don't need to change. And they are coming from a place of self-love. And so what it really comes down to is our beliefs about our worth, our beliefs about who we are and how we hold ourselves in the world. And I think that the only way to really make change is to have vulnerable, authentic conversations about our experiences and to continue not to perpetuate a system that is not serving because it's only getting larger. And if we pay attention to that area, it's, it, it grows. If we pay attention to the area in which, okay, how do I speak to this that makes me feel good? How do I speak to this in a way that's going to be communicated? It's just walking the walk. That comes down to who's watching. The next generation is watching us. That is why they look the way that they do, why they value what they do. It is a, it is a collective experience that they are taking on and then showing us. The only way to change it is to walk a walk that's aligned with our authentic being and grounded in self-love. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. I love that. Um, so um, I want to go back to you um, with you, like you're talking about some self-love. And um, I know that you had an experience um, with, um, she was, you said like your sister, uh, Maria, and that kind of um, changed some, some stuff for you. Uh, I want to know I know that that kind of, you were talking about wearing her clothes and anyone who's followed you, um, you create these beautiful YouTube videos and you've, you've discussed this and um, kind of how this has played a, a part into your journey. So I would love for you to um, kind of talk about, um, I know you were in the Navy and some stuff happened and, and that kind of shifted um, your your kind of way of life. And then um, the event that happened with your sister, uh, Maria, I was wondering if you would mind sharing some of that stuff with people to um, explain your journey a little bit. Yeah. So it's funny because I was wearing Emily's shirt today and it was a shirt that I inherited and it said ghostess with the mostess. And I reached for it right away to get ready to work out today. And I was like, she is the ghostess with the mostest today because I will be talking about the importance of these clothes and how they were this blueprint for me in my life and what they led to. Um, my journey struggling with an eating disorder started previous to that. It started with um, my father's passing and I was in scarcity. And I, because I wanna talk about uh, my journey of mental illness. And I think that that's really important to have this conversation and what, I, and what I'd like to have more conversations about collectively. So when my father died, my mom um, immediately was just like, she didn't know how to express anything other than what she says now is like, I wanted to be, I wanted to either be happy around you or I didn't want to be around you. So she started hiding herself and then she got in a toxic relationship and there was a lot of abuse in my family growing up previous to that. And so then this abuser came into my life and my mom kind of stepped to the side, but they were even worse. And so I was kicked out of my family home at a very young age at 14 years old. And I was in scarcity. I did not know when I would get my next meal. And so I would overeat and I was addicted to food. And that food became a distraction for me feeling sad. If I just thought about food all day, I didn't have to think about the fact that I was homeless at 14 years old. If I just thought about you know, when I was going to purge the food that I had just eaten, then I didn't like, I got a high from that. I got a release from that. I was able to leave my emotions. I was able to, what I say, leave my body because my body's what's feeling. So if I want to leave my body and just go somewhere else, I was using food as a pathway to do that, which led to also drug addiction. I was addicted to drugs at a very young age as well. And this is previous to joining the military. So it came from a lot of scarcity. It came from this lack of self-worth. It came from this abandonment that I experienced through my family. It also then started with, you know, the first time I ever uh, purged, it was another gr little girl that was like, ha gave me this idea. And cause I started to gain weight and I was conscious of it. I had bullies, you know? And so then I started to compensate with the purging, which led to that more behavior. So eating disorders are a socio-psychological, biological disorder. They're everything. You cannot separate 
the experience from which thing is what's created. I can't say that pageants didn't create it. I can't say that um, modeling in the future didn't create it or exponentialize. I can't say that just that one trauma did because it's a repeated behavior. So, but it's a, it's a obsessive way of, ex of leaving your feelings, leaving your emotions, not wanting to be in your experience with your emotions. And for me, that was like wearing a mask. And I did that in family homes often because I didn't know, um, I, I wanted my needs to be taken care of. I needed somewhere to stay. So when I was in family homes, like another person's family, I would always act happy or I would always act like really inspiring because I felt like that kept me safe. So keeping myself safe, meaning a home and food meant putting on a mask. So then it went to, I joined the military and um, because I was homeless again, and I had lived with my best friend, Emily, and her family growing up. We got in a terrible fight as um, an 18 year old. I was living in a house in the attic and I didn't even have electricity, but it was better than not being homeless. But I remember she was like, your parents are my parents. And I was like the worst thing that you could say to me. And so I left and I was sleeping on the side of churches and I, and I was taking a lot of drugs. I, I had to have her mom, I called her mom one night because I overdosed and I'd been awake for like five days and I knew that I had to change my life. Like I, I, I knew I had to change my life, but I didn't know how my older brother was in the military. So I was like, okay, well, he says the military is kind of the answer and I need somewhere to live. So I joined the military. My uncle told me, do not be a bosom mate or a cook. And then I ended up a cook and I married a bosom mate. So I went to the military. I put on a mask. I needed my needs to be taken care of. So I put on a completely different mask of how I would walk, how I would talk, who I would be. Boot camp was extremely difficult for me. It was very clear that I was binge eating while I was there. It was, I got in trouble for cookies one day. Like I had to do what's called an around the world where they punish me in front of everyone for not being part of the group. Um, I was, a, I was an individual and I, and I, and I wanted to question things like, well, why? And there was no, well, why it's, you're doing it because you're, that's what you do. And so I joined the military. You know, I went through my A school. I went over to Japan. Legally, there's some things I'm not allowed to discuss. I signed what's called a page 13, which is a, a gag order for my experiences in the military, because that is how I was offered a way to come home. So I went over to Japan and I experienced some very traumatic things. And during my time of hazing and military sexual trauma and mostly hazing, um, I, I said there was things going wrong. There, there, was, there was things that weren't right. And I thought that I was going to be protected, but the protection was not in, it, it was not what I needed it to be. The protection was they sent me to a mental institution and said that I was unstable and crazy and that when the NCIS did the investigation that it wasn't true because I was crazy. So then they could write it off. And at that time I was also taking meds because then they were like, oh, well, these meds will make you feel better. You know, it will numb this experience. Essentially, that's what I heard. But also I wasn't really allowed to do anything unless I took the medications because they were given to me by a doctor and part of my plan. And you don't really have a lot of power over your body in the military. Like technically in the laws, you're not even allowed to get a sunburn. Like it's you, you are, you are a, a weapon and that's what you're there to do. And so I left the military on an immense amount. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you, um, as like, there's a lot more women in the military now. And as you're speaking about this, I wanted to ask you, uh, when you were talking about, like, it was obvious that you were like binge eating and stuff like that. Is there anyone who, who's as more women are coming in or in your experience that you had, is there anyone who steps in and kind of says, Hey, we kind of noticed that this is going on. Do you need help with this? Or do, do they just pretend that it doesn't exist? No. So I, um, I went to school to be a cook, a chef, and I was the top of my class because you could score very low and still get into the Navy with this type of score. And I, and I scored very, very high. It's just, I was homeless. So I could, I could take on things very quickly. So I was teaching in the front with the teacher when he would say things, I would, I would do them. And then the rest of the class would do it. And I would have extra time 
to uh, bake. So I learned baking. Baking also gave me this, uh, this even fueled my addiction further to sugar. One day I was, I purged so much so that I, that I busted the capillaries in, in the bottoms of, of both of my eyes. And it was very obvious. My, my eye was, it looked like blood. It was like my eye plus blood. And, um, I went to the, at the time I was on an army base and I went to them and, you know, I, I explained kind of, I, you'll do anything in an eating disorder to cover it. The biggest part for me of overcoming the shame of speaking about it publicly is that I've lied because I, as my spirit is, as like the, the person that's the most aligned, I don't like, I'm very authentic. I'm very honest. And I pride myself in that, but I've lied. I've lied to protect the eating disorder. The eating disorder was was telling me these things about how it was the one thing that was my friend, essentially, and to keep it alive because the eating disorder wants to stay alive. Your subconscious only knows your past experience and it'll do anything to keep you in that uncomfortable, uncomfortable or keep you in the comfortable familiarity. And since the eating disorder was a way of coping with my emotions, it was trying to survive. So I remember I, I mentioned that I was I purged. And um, I mentioned that I think I said I was sick. It was like I was sick or or something like this because they made me go. They were like, you have to go and talk to somebody. They thought that I got beat up. They thought that there were things happening at the Navy base where I was being abused. But it wa I wasn't. It was a me thing. Um, but no one stepped in at that point. At that point, the Army base was trying to protect whether or not I had a superior that was abusing me. And when it comes to like my message to women joining the military, because I have now connected with other women who have had similar experiences like mine, I was part of a national exhibit at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. in like four years ago. An artist came and I was teaching mindfulness to veterans at the time. I was a mentor to military veterans, helping them access their educational benefits, get into school. And so... I finally met other women like me because there's the the concept of like this gag order and also that you don't sp you don't speak about these things. You don't speak about what happened to you. No one's going to love you. Like it's a uh, very traumatic. No one would ever understand it. Why would you ever talk about that? It it carried it with me for a very very long time. And when I finally went to Washington DC, the artist there was talking about these problems that exist within the non-equality that exists between men and women in the military and how we change that for the next generation and to speak about our experiences as they are impactful and powerful for the generation that's coming so that they understand how to navigate their way in the military and, and that the military system can then change. Because my experience was I was one of less than 20 women on a 200 man ship and they did not like women. And it was very apparent. And it was hard. The person who came through the same um, the same division as me was also put in a mental institution right before I got there. And so these things that exist within that system that's perpetuated, it it's dark. It's very dark. And, and I don't think I think it there change does happen when we speak about our experiences in order to like change the system itself. Right. But it starts at an individual level in order to make changes. But my mental health, when I was suffering in my mental health, um, leaving the military, I, I, another woman protected me. I was hiding in a closet, actually. She locked me in a closet and they came looking for me. And um, I remember her protecting me. And she also sat next to my bedside um, when I was on suicide watch. And when I was very, very sick, I was on, the only way out that I was offered or the only help that I was really offered was very, very medicine based, extremely medicine based. And the places that I was in and the hospitals that I was part of, I, I do not think even that system of medical care for mental health, as I understand it now as a whole, is broken. And so there changes have to be made in how to offer better, better mental health care, not just for people in the military, but as our system as a whole to teach us our human spirit and the ability that we have to heal trauma, the ability that we have to express our emotions and to understand that we're safe within our bodies so that we can come out of that place that keeps us in, in, the, in those past behaviors, which for me was um, at this point, a very extended uh, bulimia, 
And I think that my spirit guided me to this experience of being a cook to heighten this experience so that I could see what it was like to wear a mask. Because at this point in my life, wearing a mask is not optional. And sharing that what pain comes from wearing a mask has allowed me to really help other people who are putting masks on throughout their experience. I went into a lot there. <laughs> I think I I didn't mention, you know, my sister and what happened after that. If you want, I can go into that, a little bit of that as well, or if you have any other questions. I was just going to, before you go into that, you can go into that. I do want to ask um, where you had talked about, you know, they were giving you medicine and things like that. So knowing that you, you had an eating disorder at that point and people saying to you, like, you're crazy and take medicine. Do you think that that also made it worse because people are just trying to throw like pharmaceuticals at you to diagnose it and, and try to make it something that it's not? Did that, did that make it worse for you? So in the beginning, I was not like I the main reason in the mental hospital I was so scared to say that I did anything to myself that would be of a like shameful or be wrong or be my fault that it was mostly a focus on depression on sleep on um, my want to commit suicide to keep me alive um I don't know the depths in which or at what point I was as honest as I am now about what was going on with having an eating disorder because I was so scared that I would be to blame and that they would throw me out that I honestly, I, it was just me trying to, it was the story of my eating disorder and also of, you know, will I be safe? Like, is this safe for me? And in my mind and everything that was showing me is like, it's not safe to be yourself. Do not be yourself. And the medications that I was put on for depression, for sleep, for anxiety, um, I think I was on three or four meds for my mood. They wanted to stabilize my mood. So I was on medications for someone with bipolar. And I remember that I would just, or no, I think I was on a psych, antipsychotic. I was on an antipsychotic because they were, you know, the things that it was like this un, unrelenting ability to not accept my reality as true that also was being reflected back to me. And the medications that I took made everything worse. They made everything worse. And not only did they make it worse, um, like my ex-husband, he was with me for the holidays. I remember one year right before I got out and I would I was just staring at the wall. And when he would speak to me, I, it, it was processing, but it was almost like slow motion and I didn't feel good. My whole body hurt. I couldn't sleep ever. And so I would just sit. And then when he would get frustrated about my lack of like response, I would just cry. And so I was just sitting there crying, staring at the wall. And that was my life. Like, that's what I did. And I just couldn't accept my reality. And the more that that happened, the more medications I was put on. Because it was like, oh, well, now I can't sleep. So because I would just be laying there at night thinking about my life. And then it would be like, now you have a sleep medication. Now you have an anti-anxiety medication. And this led to disease later in my life. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of stuff gets pushed. And as you were talking about that, it kind of reminds me of like, um, you know, when you take depression medication and it blocks you from, sure, you don't feel depressed, but you don't feel anything. You just kind of zombie through life and and I remember that myself when I took it and I was like I want to kill myself because I just don't feel nothing you know like this is awful I, so that also I've had that experience as well with um chronic migraines migraines used to be debilitating for me I was hospitalized for them all the time and I used to get Botox injections 30 of them all in my neck all in my forehead all in my face and um they helped because I couldn't tense anything However, what I've mm. seen through, I went through the, the VA does have a six week, it's like a boot camp now, and it's for healing in mindfulness based practices. And you have a whole team of people. You have an occupational therapist, a, a pain psychologist. I got acupuncture while I was doing it. We did virtual reality where I would meditate. I had people helping me with my body. So what it came down to was by the time that I was so out of order that it got to this part of my crown, as I now understand energy. I was experiencing migraines in the full shutdown because my human spirit could not take that amount of stress that I was causing my body. 
And so, yeah, the Botox injections work. They also made it unable for me to mirror people's expressions because bo that's what Botox does. It, it creates a block for us to even mirror our outer environment. And mm -hmm. so I was even putting these chemicals in my body full extent. And I was taking daily medications. This was up until very recently. And I thought that it was the only way. I thought it was the only way because how could I ever deal with the problems? But they were at the root in my body. But I was just ignoring them until the fact. And that's the thing with medications is if you're not treating the root of something, which is the belief in where it's held in your body, then you will not heal. And these medications are only giving your power away to a system that is making money off of you being sick and needing more medication and then needing more sick care. We don't have a, a health care system. We have a sick care system. Yep. And that's an extreme problem, especially for mental illness. Yeah. And I think it's because it's profitable, you know, like people don't, you know, they don't want to say, oh, let's actually get health care and like make it focus on what you eat, what you're putting in your body, because a lot of those things, and I know you've talked about this as well, a lot of those things can help you heal and help you feel better. Uh, you know, if you start clean eating after like n taking, like abusing your body for years, there's going to be a huge difference. So I love that you just focused on that too, because I think that there's, I think that there's a real lack of, you know, even when you look at, I remember the food pyramid growing up and, and, you know, and it would be like all the really healthy stuff is right at the top and there's like none. And then everything that's going to make you tired, sick, lazy, fat is at the bottom and you're loading up on those things. <laughs> yes. And, you know, that's, I think, such an important change. And can you talk about, um, can you talk about how that has improved your life? That aspect of incorporating Which aspect? that. So incorporating the health, actual like health care versus the sick care. Yes. So my journey of coming back into wholeness with myself, um, I actually this summer had like a little lapse where I took medication. I was like, this will help me. And you can actually see me on Instagram screaming at God, which I did not put in the video that that's what I saw afterwards. I understood why it was so like. I was screaming at God. I was like, why can't I know? Like so upset. It was very helpful for me to realize that that was how I felt when I took medications and to no longer do that. It was helpful in the moment for me to release, but I wouldn't have felt the way that I did if I wouldn't have taken a medication. Um, my journey to coming back to wholeness came from looking at the root and the root for me it meant I had to look at the things I didn't want to look at. I had to look at the fact that my best friend was murdered by her husband in front of her kids. And that was extremely devastating for me. And I had to look at the fact that I was abused growing up. I had to look at the fact that I was abandoned. I had to look at the fact that I was a drug addict. Like I had to look at my why behind all the behaviors that were not serving me. And in order to do that, I had to go past my conscious mind and into my subconscious because my conscious knew that I was doing things that, that were wrong. I'm like, I'm addicted to cocaine, but like, I don't, I can't stop. Like, I was like, I want to be thin and I'm getting messages from the outside world. Like, this is what all the rich people do. I'm in the, all the right places. Like that conscious like, okay, I have a problem. I can talk about the problem. I know there's other people who don't have this problem. So I know there's a solution didn't help me. I had to have, there's five key elements for lasting change and it's cognition, knowing that there's a problem, knowing that there's a solution, mindfulness, being in the present moment, understanding yourself in the present, what is still coming up for you. And then the third is creativity. If you do not create a new path, a new pathway in your brain, a new choice, that's all that is, is over time, your subconscious is like the woods. If you go down one path one time, no problem. It's just a path. You can't even see it. If somebody goes down the same path all the time to go out into the woods, you see that path. And that's how your brain works. It fires and wires that way. So if you are not creating a new path, then you are not going to have sustainable lasting change, which the other keys are an action plan. So how are you going to create that change? And then discipline. So consistency essentially is like, if your past is, is causing 
unresonance in your presence. So you're eating, you're escaping your emotions with food and addictive behaviors or bad relationships or whatever it is. If you're escaping in the now, your environment is only reflecting to you how you're being and how you're being comes from how you think and then how you act. The only way to change that is to make consistent focus towards that future that you know that you can have where you're healthy, where you're happy, you have good relationships, you eat healthy, you're in tune with your spirit. I have only found that through creativity. I've only found that through consistent action of expressing myself and being in tune with my emotions, having a healthy emotional outlet. The emotions is what's trapped in our body. And if you're going to therapy and you're only getting cognition, not only are you not getting all of the steps, but you are not addressing the trauma in your body. You're actually perpetuating that it's a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem. I need help. So I'm, I'm different than everyone else. Like I know with ADHD for myself, it's like everyone kept telling me all these ideas about ADHD and how they weren't a superpower. And now I'm like, ADHD is a superpower. I'm not going to sit in front of somebody ever again and have them tell me that I'm different and that that's bad and wrong. Well, the, the behavior of going to a doctor means that you think there's something wrong with you and that you can't fix it. And then they perpetuate that by saying, you're alone, I'm the person you should talk to about it. And then let's perpetuate this system of this, this being a problem. When really we have the ability to express our emotions and ask ourselves, what is it that we're feeling and create a deeper connection to our mind, body and spirit because that, that spirit comes from love. If you are in a place of loving yourself, you, you move in different ways. That anger, that guilt, that shame, you address it in a way of compassion and empathy and understanding, but you give it its space because it needs that. Um, I do want to ask you because you have mentioned her a couple of times and I know that, um, uh, kind of what you did with her clothes was really important. So can you share, um, about Maria and how that impacted your life? And I know that you ended up doing something beautiful with some of her clothes for her daughters. And I think that that's, a um, for the creative aspect, I think it was such a a beautiful thing that you and your mom did. So will you share a little bit about that too and how that's impacted your journey to where you are now? Yes. So Emily was my best friend growing Sorry, up I and I lived with her family. Yeah, you're okay. Her name's Emily. Yeah. Um, she was my best friend growing up for a long time. Her family took me in and we grew up like sisters. We, I mean, we even fought like sisters, you know, like we were ruthless sometimes, but, um, we were best, best friends. And her family is still like my family. I call, I call her mom, my pseudo mom. And we have a very close and deep connection. Um, we were inseparable. And I remember uh, maybe a year before she died, um, when I was living with her at 17, that's when the abusive relationship started for her. And um, she was being abused by a boyfriend that in the home that I lived in. And I remember when me and my friend called the cops and she was mad at us. Like, I remember that. So that started very early on before a few years before she was killed. And, um, but she was in multiple abusive relationships and she was also diagnosed bipolar, took medications ever since I've known her ever since like, actually, no, cause I knew her like really young, but maybe since like middle school, seventh grade. Um, and she met somebody, he, she went to Alaska and married him. It was all very dark. He was a very, is a very, very dark and very abusive human being. Um, he was going to go to prison for, um, I think it was rape or something to that extent. And Emily was divorcing him, but she wanted to give her, um, their children the opportunity to say goodbye because he was going to go to prison. And so she went to, bring her children to his home and she was trying to leave. She was in an SUV and the door was open and she was in the, in the seat with a 16 year old, um, a family friend in the passenger seat. And he point blank, 
um, shot her three times and murdered her in front of her kids and um, the other person who was there who was underage as well. And um, it's 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 wild and not because God doesn't give you more than you can handle at the time. I had a friend visiting from back home in Ohio here in Florida, and I hadn't had a friend visit in years. And she knew her and she grew up with her, too. So when I got the call, actually, Sammy was the person who told me she's like, did you like, I think there's something happening. And then I got a call immediately from someone else in my life. And um, I was devastated. I mean, I was absolutely devastated. And um, I went home to spend some time with my pseudo family and to just be with them and uh, her six month old daughters, twin daughters and her three year old at the time. And she wasn't in the car when that happened. Only the six month old were. And um, I really wanted to feel close to her. I really wanted to feel connected. I hadn't I hadn't talked to her for eight months. We had gotten in an argument. This was not uncommon for us. Um, she and and it was almost the same exact argument that happened when we were 18 where we didn't speak for a while but it was over her parents i was very protective over her mom and um we got in a fight about it and i wanted to feel close to her and she was always thinner than i was and um but i wore her clothes growing up because my mom didn't buy me clothes in high school her her mom did um and so i just gathered everything that I, that I could hold on to that reminded me of her, that, that gave me that feeling of, of home with her spirit. Like her jewelry was even broken. She had like cheap Claire's jewelry and it was like broken. And I took that with me too. And I remember, so I inherited a lot of her clothes, most of her clothes out of anybody. I was the one who, who received a lot of her things and I took them back to Florida with me. And, um, that's when anorexia got really bad. I, I just, I, it was hard for me enough for me to tell people that somebody very close to me was murdered in front of their kids, but then their reaction of like, they didn't know how to talk. It was like, they would be like, I don't know how to respond. And then I would be like, well, I don't know how to live life. Like, I would just be like, I don't know. Like, I can't tell anybody because the people that I know are back home and they're all mad that I wasn't there, you know, for her, there was this sense of just like, and like anger that I had, but I couldn't feel it yet. I couldn't feel the rage. I couldn't feel an aliveness. All I felt was sad. All I felt was despair. How could somebody do that? That's what kept going through my mind was like, how could somebody do this? And I couldn't get over it. And it's still hard for me. This, it, this, this sense of like, how could you do that? So I starved myself and, um, I lost weight very, very quickly. I mean, like 25 pounds. And uh, maybe within two months, and I wore her clothes on a consistent basis. I didn't even want it. I remember as a bowling alley, my friends were finally like, "You need to leave the house." And um, I was at a bowling alley, and somebody spilled something on me, and it was like the end of the world. Like I was so incredibly upset that somebody could spill clothes or spill something on my clothes because my clothes were that attachment. I was living in that pain. I was fully embodied in it. I was wearing it. I was literally wearing it physically. Uh, people could see it on me. Um, you know, I just, that's where, where I was at at that part of my story. And I didn't think that I had time to kind of talk about it. I, I just didn't, I couldn't, I didn't think that I could talk about it. And so that went on for a long time until I was having heart problems and um, I was on my deathbed and I had to wear a heart monitor all the time. Um, I was consistently, I consistently wanted to die a, but B I was having health problems and my health problems were getting multi-layered. And, um, that's when I started to realize that I needed treatment, that I needed to go to a hospital for it and that I couldn't just do it, um, by myself. And I needed to start processing what actually was going on for me. And, um, I did seek care, um, for about six months, it was back and forth between me and my insurance. And I would keep showing up to hospitals thinking it was covered. And then they would cuff me, Baker Act me, and take me to the VA. And that was really traumatic for me because I knew that I was 
uh, my even my player my my care my action plan with my psychiatrist was that I was only to be in an eating disorder facility so I'd be at the VA and I'd be so upset because I'd been cuffed and put in a in in this you know, van or ambulance or whatever and taken there. And my care team was supposed to ensure that I was only going to an eating disorder facility because I didn't need to just be in a psych ward. And it was already traumatic enough for me to enough to be in a psych ward based on my experience in the military. And then I was there again with people from the military. So I was like yelling at people like, you don't understand. I have a bathroom and, and you're putting me in a room with a bathroom and I believe me and you don't know how to take care of me. Like you, I'm not here for this. And, and then, but they knew that like, I wanted to die and that I was starving myself. And, and I had also been cutting. So there was these, these things that I'd been doing that put me at risk for my health that allowed them to, to do that. But I really wanted recovery. I really wanted it. And even when um, I have a letter that I wrote to myself that um, I read again recently, my intuition told me to read it uh, in my life. And I remember it was like, I was talking to myself like it will get better. It was like my future self was like, it will be okay. Like this will make sense one day. And um, I remember even at the end, I was like, change one person, change the world. And then the next sentence was like, or some bullshit. Like I didn't fully believe in it, but I knew I had a purpose on this planet and it kept my spirit alive. And that writing also kept my spirit alive. And so I, I went to treatment. I finally got treatment for anorexia because my life was at, at risk um, consistently. And um over time, I started to create a different relationship with myself. I won't say that that eating disorder treatment in an inpatient facility is best. I think it helped me to gain uh, my health. I also it also perpetuates the medical system. So I wasn't taught anything about nutrition. I was just told eat the food in front of you. Or you're not allowed to go outside. My first day, I remember I just sat there, triggered everybody at the table. I was like, you eat this much? Just bawling my eyes out. Um, but I didn't under they didn't teach me anything about nutrition. Creativity wasn't part of it. We were just in a room, but it allowed me to not engage in behaviors. Like I needed to be in a cell essentially so that I could be around other people that understood what it was like to have an eating disorder, A, which is what my spirit really, really drove me there to do. And then B, so that I could actually start to make progress in feeding myself on a consistent basis and then not engaging and purging afterwards. And so then it came to these items that I had that reminded me of my sister. And like I said, the one that I wore this morning was kind of funny. And I think I only have maybe three left that that are in my physical environment that that one it cracks me up because like it says ghostess with the mostess and like she's not here anymore. And and giving her this energy and attention today felt like a very perfect like time to wear this shirt because she is the ghostess with the mostess on a day where we're talking about her. Like she's here in consciousness. So I'm speaking about her. So she is. And it was funny because I was intuitively drawn to that shirt. I forgot that I even still had it. And most people thought it was a Halloween shirt at the gym this morning. So they're all <laughs> laughing about it. Ghosts with the Moses. And I, I'm just laughing about it. Like, I know it's just so funny. And, um, but her clothes played such an important role and I needed to close that chapter of my life. And in order to close that chapter of my life, I needed to do something that was creative and I needed to do something that incorporated something that I would give back, something that had meaning, something that would be, I call it an anchor experience now as I understand creativity, but it's, it's a deliberate and intentional action against like the past behavior to create the new thing that also gives purpose. And so I took her clothes and I remember, this is also another layer of, of um, what happened in her family's life or, and people who I was connected to, but her during COVID, Emily's cousin, John, who was the same age as us, uh, he was in my third grade class, the first time I ever met him. We were friends my whole life as well. And um, he was diagnosed with lymphoma and he was given six weeks to live. And he digressed very, very quickly because he wasn't allowed to have any visitors. So no one could say goodbye to him. He just died by himself. And um, he was 28 
and I knew that he was going to die. I, when I was told it was within days, um, because they didn't tell anybody because at first it was like, well, he's just going to the hospital because he's thrown up. And then the next thing, you know, he's in the hospital, there's no one around him. And, and COVID played such a large role in this because we couldn't even have a funeral. Like there was no funeral for him. And I was dead. I mean, like still thinking about it, it was devastating, like devastating to not have a ritual to celebrate somebody's life. And, um, I knew that I had to go home. And so my friend had a private plane and they were making deliveries because you couldn't, you couldn't fly. Like, it was like, I, there was no way for me to get home. And so I was like, no, I, I don't accept this. I was like, I don't accept this. And my spirit was like, okay, I'm going to give you everything you need then. And so I flew on a biplane from Florida to Ohio. And the wild part was that I knew that he would die as soon as I got in the air. I, and I, like, I knew it. I felt it. I felt him leave. Um, I got the message still on my phone from um, my pseudo mom. And I went to my mom's house because my, my mom and my pseudo mom are now friends. Uh, the day that she adopted Emily's daughters, my mom dressed as Belle in a princess outfit and went over to her house and read them stories like a, like a princess. And I knew that they knew my mom for that. And I knew that they loved the Disney princess thing and they were just so excited. And so I wanted to be there for my family in a time where, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't connection and people were suffering. And so I was like, what can I do? And so I was like, I'm going to surprise them. I'm going to show up for support. I'm going to watch the girls so that Debbie can go spend time with her sister. Cause everyone was very conscious of like how many people were at what house and would you get in trouble? And like the, the cops and all these things. So I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to fly there and I'm going to dress as a Disney princess and I'm going to spend time with the girls. But my most intentional thing beyond that and tying to Emily's story was I took Emily's clothes. It was also Mother's Day weekend. And so I, I took Emily's clothes with me and I made a conscious choice. I asked Emily's mom if it was okay, um, but I needed to close that chapter of my life. And um, so me and my mom um, on Mother's Day cut up Emily's clothing, which was really hard for me. Um, but really, really like it was hard, but it was so worth it. Like, it was like, I made this choice to say like, no, not anymore. Not anymore. Like you don't get to have this power over me because I associated the clothes with the pain and her connection being through the clothes and not just her spirit. She was with me right then when I was cutting the clothes, she was probably like, yes, cut the clothes. <laughs> like her higher spirit doesn't want me to suffer. Like it, like, yeah, her higher spirits, like speaking to me because I also, I, I can have this relationship where I see her and it's like, no, she's like, yes, you have to move through this. That is part of this. This happened for a reason. And so cutting the clothes with my mom and being going home for that, um, we cut up all the clothes and the intentions were to, I also had a surprise party at my other friend Emily's house. I love surprising people. And so we ended up having a party for John. We had a, um, we like all had cake and we remembered him and we lit candles and it was a surprise that I was in town. And I wanted my friends to be part of the, the sewing her clothes into the quilt. They were not ready for that. And I needed to cut them. So I brought them to my mom. These things can be very powerful. They also are very intentional. These art practices that I practice because it's like, okay, how would I close this story? Well, the clothes are where the negative energy is. Okay, how do I address the negative energy and create something new? Okay, I need to cut the clothes up. Well, how do I make it for a purpose? And then I was like, her daughters don't have any of her clothes. I'm the only one who has them. And they would want something that makes them feel connected. And then I'm also connected to them through that. And then my mom started making, um, there's like these little boxes and on Emily's birthday, it'll be this year because last year we just weren't in alignment to create this, but she creates these little like mosh posh resin things. And so she has this vision that she's bringing to life where it's a, it's a photo frame and has Emily's picture in the background, but it has Emily in clothes. And then the clothes, like they're tiny and they're cut up from the clothes that we cut up, but they're Emily in her clothes. And then they're a photo. 
And so this was multi-layered in the way that me and my mom could do something together, which now I'm realizing also is the power of my mom to inspire creativity within me, also inspiring me to um, create this connection between both my pseudo mom and my mom, where my mom went, my mom was Tinkerbell. So I, I was Belle, my mom was Tinkerbell. And we showed up at my family's house. And I remember, cause they didn't know the little girls are like, maybe like four at the time. And they knew who I was and they knew who my mom was. And so they were just like, oh, like, so just at a time where this family is grieving the loss of somebody who's 28 years old. And during COVID, like this was a way for me to kind of see how service could connect people in, in such a beautiful way and also creativity. And so, yeah, that was a really, that was a really transformational time that entire weekend for me. And you talked about how, you know, that was really important for you, like realizing the service aspect and, um, I think that what you're starting to do, actually, um, I think what you have been doing in creating, um, you created beautiful headpieces, you're doing beautiful resin art, but most importantly, um, you started creating these wonderful workbooks and I know that they were extremely helpful for me and um, discovering little layers just by using your little workbooks and, and going through little layers that I maybe had ignored in my other work. I found things that I needed to work on. And I know that now you are starting to work on your net. Well, you've already started it and you've created this beautiful um, service to others. And I really would love for you to share about this because I think what you're doing is really impactful. I know you were talking about when you had to have care. Um, the uh, one thing that you didn't touch on, but I know you've mentioned it in your your um, in your videos is the cost for people who have eating disorders um, on a on a grand scale, how expensive that can be. And I want to tell you, I'm proud of you. It's Thank you so much for that compliment. It's it's so beautiful. And, and I've loved, um, I'll start with this series and kind of move backwards. Um, I've really loved sharing this self-love series with the world. Um, it is an intentional practice that takes you through how to, you know, the beginning is, is the mindfulness aspect of what I teach. So setting your space, setting your intention, knowing this time is for you being in the present moment. And then they always introduce an energetic is what I say. Um, sometimes like what I'm moving more towards now is education of, of the chakra energy, but it was mostly centered around um, topics like the inner critic, compassion, gratitude for the body, inner child healing. So would introduce a topic and then go step by step through an art practice that does this kind of anchoring experience. Some of them are more just a reflection. So it's introducing the topic and then you have a meditation and then you have a journal experience. And so that allows you to go deeper into your self-reflection and allow for your personal growth that comes from this kind of self-exploration that you can go on um, through just even journal prompts. And what I'm doing now and why I'm so passionate about it, I want to tell the story of I've been teaching this, this um, flow painting exercise. I'm calling it heart flow now. I've been teaching this heart flow experience for the past two and a half years. And I've taught it in quite a few different ways, sometimes with the sound healer, sometimes after yoga, um, always with the same elements, always with the mindfulness. Um, and I want to talk about the experience first, and then I want to talk about where it comes from. So you're invited to see the canvas as a reflection of yourself through a meditation at the beginning. And so it starts out coming into the present moment and seeing and inviting the canvas to kind of show you, um, you, where your emotional state is at. And then the canvas is laid on the ground and the paint is around you. And now I go through different emotional states through the music and they continue on a journey. And you're, there's always a journey. The journey has looked different in some of my experiences, but there's always a journey that you go on. And there's cues that I say that match the sound with the music or match the music to bring out different elements of emotional expression through this experience. And the invitation is to use everything that you've been given, 
which um, I like to do this outside. So I've had some people, even my paintings included, that have grass on them. Um, you're, you don't use a paintbrush. It's your connection to your outer environment and whatever's been provided in that experience. So um, I've had people, even um, you were part of this experience, there's somebody who I think they use coffee grounds in a paper towel because they didn't have the um, acrylic or the canvas. And like that was beautiful because the whole intention is to see how your outer world is a reflection of you and then use what you're given in order to create create something that allows for new awareness and the powerful part of this experience is that it is addressing the traumas that are stored in our body we are moving things through us in a somatic experience so first the meditation happens and then it's a dance and i like to do the dance part like I like to pick up the paint and then grab the paint and then splatter it. Like I love to just take the paint bottles, they're like this big, and just throw them. Like that's my favorite part about it. And then trust that the paint will like make a cool design that then I can be in tune with. Whatever comes through, the, the best way is to, or the intention is to be in a space of compassion and non-judgment for whatever comes through. So even if I have thoughts that are like, this doesn't look good, what is going on here? This is not a painting. Like I don't, then my, my understanding is then to, to question that reality. Well, who says that that's a painting or why is, doesn't it look beautiful? And how do I keep moving? So it's like, how do I move my body and how do I move through that feeling and then address it with the, the stories that I'm holding in my body? Cause they come up during this painting experience. And so then at the end, there's this beautiful, um, canvas that you have that's a reflection of where you were at and also all these insights that you got along the journey that are cued through the music as well as with my guidance and inviting spirit to kind of show the way like to come into mind body spirit connection now i made this realization um very recently that when i started doing this experience it was because i was I was mimicking my body in a purge. So I had already, and I'll go to how I started making art. I hadn't been making art for years. I was, I was a researcher and a writer. And I was, even in my master's degree, I was very heavily involved in eating disorder research. I started out with the um, pro anemia websites. That's how I fed my eating disorder as a very young girl. And I knew that I was like, well, where are the pro recovery communities and why would they be important? And so for my first 18 months, I studied self-identity and the importance of group behavior and group think and group identity. And then I, I put forth for my thesis that I would create an online community where we would have the shared identity of being in recovery because I knew from my undergrad studying substance abuse and mental health counseling that AA was very successful because you had an identity of being in recovery. So everyone's shared ideas, thoughts, and behaviors were, were perpetuated by a system of how are you your best you in recovery? And that's why it was across the board so successful. So I started to look at this and I was like, okay, we need a space where recovery is the group identity because often people do not talk about their eating disorders. A, there is a huge stigma and shame that is associated with the behaviors that come from an eating disorder and lack of knowledge in the community. Beyond that, it is the second highest rate of mortality of any mental illness. And the, one of the main reasons why is it costs on average between 45, and this is the average still, between $45,000 and $70,000 to receive treatment for an eating disorder. And this is one month of care. So it's $1,500 a day on average. And the regular, and the, go ahead. I was just saying, wow, that's, it's, that's a lot of money. It, I mean, it's, it, it's insane. And, and, people are not getting the care they need because this is only for inpatient. And even in my experience, um, the, you have to be sick enough, right? You have to be sick enough. And if you like, even when I had bulimia and binge eating, no one had a, no one, no one knew I had an eating disorder. Not only that, but I wasn't sick enough to be considered, uh, my insurance would cover it for me to be in a hospital. Even the intake forms that exist around this, this way of getting care, are extremely unhelpful for somebody who is looking for this. So I started to look at that and the university was like, 
this research is unethical for a thesis because I couldn't control the environment. There was, I was going to be putting things, uh, one big point of doing ethical research, especially under a university, is that you, they are legally responsible for anything that happens in that community because you're underneath their umbrella. So they didn't want to be legally responsible for an online community. However, my re it didn't mean that it didn't need to exist. That's what my research stated is like, this needs to exist. And so I went further into my research in a thesis. It was a phenomenological analysis of women with eating disorders. And it studied a phenomenon as a lived experience or something that happens. And so the phenomenon of having an eating disorder. And then I looked for commonalities. The commonality was a false sense of identity low self-worth, and then that being perpetuated by groups in which someone self-identifies. So that's where, again, it came in, all right, well, if people are in groups that are identifying with values and beliefs that would perpetuate not feeling worthy, and they're not self-identifying as being in recovery, then how will this happen? How will this change be made? And so for me, it was like, Okay, self identity is so important. So, a saying that you that you um, are taking your power back from an eating disorder, saying you're in recovery, because a lot of people say I'm bulimic, I'm anorexic. That means you are that thing. You're not that thing. So, the first step with saying I suffer from food addiction or eating disordered behaviors that separates you from being the thing, and then saying recovery. I'm in recovery. The power of our language and the power of self-identity is so important. In fact, it is the base of what perpetuates behaviors that keep someone stuck in an eating disorder is their belief around themselves, but also the groups around them. And I think this is really interesting because last night I was thinking about this on Instagram. So I'll explain it very simply. If you are part of a group you are saying that you have shared values. So if you're on Instagram, the shared value is that um, self-expression, let me turn this on silent, sorry. Um, self-expression is important. So here are the values on Instagram, being part of this community, saying you'll be on the community. Self-expression, individualism, creative expression, self-expression and doing that through the form of videos, audio, and photo. So on Instagram, you can find perpetuated ideas of the culture as a collective and as a whole, which then lead to these ideas of perfectionism and lack of self-worth because people are self-identifying. The base level is just they like to express themselves, but they're expressing themselves through also the American culture. So when people are going on Instagram, say, to look for maybe inspiration or to share their eating disorder recovery journey, they're not going to find very helpful information. In fact, they may find they're against a system that is based in the ego and is based on saying, look how good I look or look how much money that I have, or a lie, like not vulnerable, not authentic. You don't say Instagram is a, is a place where the shared values are people are very authentic people are really vulnerable that across the board i would not say that so i'll go back to my practices because what i've learned through my practices is you know when i started my art business and i'm like jumping on this timeline so let me know if you're not following um but when i started my art business it came to me in a dream I was not an artist. I didn't even have anything to express myself. I was a researcher. I was a writer. I had just finished um, college. I was, my first business had failed. I was working as a teacher. I did not make art. It was nothing like this. And I had a dream and there was art all over the place. And I was teaching art and I was like happy and I saw myself. And so I was like, told my friend Audrey, she's an artist. And I was like, Audrey, I had a dream that I was an artist and that I was teaching art and my life has changed. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Like, this is gonna be, you're gonna love art so much. And our friend was standing next to us, I remember, and he goes, I'm just not as like messed up as you guys right now. Like he didn't understand that I trusted so much that this was possible for me, that I could be happy, that I could be expressive, that my life really did change. And so I was making art 
I just, I started making it. I started drawing the symbols that I saw in my dream. I started tracing them. I'd look them up online and then I'd trace them. And then they started to show up in my environment. So I knew that I was being called and that I was following, you know, what, and it felt good. It felt good. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm expressing myself. I always thought that I couldn't do this, but now I'm, I'm doing it. And so that created this journey of me creating art, but I hadn't gotten to the flow pain experience yet. What I was doing was combining mindfulness, which I was teaching to veterans previous to that for the first five years, combining mindfulness with energy. So I was teaching the chakras. I was teaching the importance of painting, anchoring experiences. I was intuitively called to do mindfulness and then a art experience that allowed us to move through a certain type of topic. And then the after we would have something to show for it, that anchor experience. My first workshop was the root chakra. We called in the source light energy. We painted a box white. I talked about the root chakra. I called out root chakra affirmations to unblock the root chakra. The ones that were the most aligned, you would write them down, put them in your box to keep them for later so that you could have this box which had a crystal that would that would unlock the root chakra and or or open that energy so that later you could open the box and trust that whatever message your past self sent for future you was meant for you for that day and so then we put the root chakra on the top well at this point i had painting supplies around my apartment because I was following my spirit which was telling me that i was an artist and so i was and then it started to create this change in my life that was amazing and so i one day was really really overwhelmed with emotions and in the past where i would leave my body and use food or use drugs as a way of coping and i would leave the experience i chose to paint so there was a day where i was overwhelmed with emotions and instead of i had already been healing through mindfulness i had already been using art at this point i was trusting my spirit enough that i was teaching it in community because anything i found that had changed my life i wanted to teach people right away i've always been like that i'm like this changed my life i need everyone to know about it because past me needs this or like would have needed this so i i gathered all this paint and I put the canvas on the ground. And I remember I even got dressed up in an outfit that brought out even more of that emotion for me. And then I turned on music. And when I turned on the music, I was filled with emotions. I went even deeper into my emotions, like bawling my eyes out. I wanted to move my body. I wanted to dance. So I started moving my body. And then that's the first time I ever threw paint. And that's the first time I ever did this experience. And what I realize now is that I was leaned over the top of the canvas, just like I was for 15 years over a toilet during a purge. And my body was intuitively doing the same things so that I could replace the addiction to that adrenaline that I had in the high of the purge. I could replace it with something that would actually leave me feeling better. So instead of going to the, to the lower vibration and acting within that guilt and that shame and that feelings of anger that I, would, that I didn't want to address in my past self, when in the heights of my, of my bulimia, instead, whatever was present in that moment, I leaned into. I was like, I can handle these emotions. I'm equipped. I'm equipped to handle these emotions. I'm going to express my emotions. I'm going to be here with me now. Because when I had bulimia, not only was the experience stressful, but then the actions and behaviors that I did afterwards made it even twofold. So I felt even worse afterwards. It started with just something triggered me, but then I felt even worse with my behaviors. So this experience allowed me to overcome the addiction that I had to the adrenaline, as well as create a painting. And my paintings were showing me the next way forward. They started to, like we were talking about before, have these different pieces that were just guiding me. They were allowing me to express myself. And by the time I was done with you know, a painting, it'd be 30 minutes in, I wouldn't even know how much time had passed. I just knew I felt better. I knew I had a beautiful painting to remind myself of the experience. I knew that it was changing me. I knew that it was changing things. Um, uh you had talked about it when you had written that letter to yourself before about the important, like when, um, you know, you, and you had talked about like the importance of saying I am, or, you know, I used to be like, Oh, like people who manifest are weirdos. And, but it's because at that point, you know, like sometimes people like are like, okay, you know, I, I, one of the big ones, everyone always says, Oh, I'm going to be rich or whatever, you know? And, 
there are people like, I can't manifest that. But it's not about that. It's about believing in yourself. And and this is something that I, especially this past year, and especially with following you and, and watching it, I've learned like manifestation is a little bit different than what I had thought because you put in the work to get those things that you want. And it's about believing. And I think that that's what's lacking a lot in the world is that kind of like people say, oh, I'm great or I'm wonderful. But they don't think about those things like they don't really believe that. And you touched on that earlier. You teach that in such a creative way because I know it's helped me and it helped me kind of like look at manifestation in a different uh, from a different angle and to be like, hey, I can do great things, too, you know, so. I'm so excited for you. Yes. And, and I think that this is going to be so helpful. Thank you. I, I'm I'm very excited. And I want to touch on manifestation really quickly, because this is something that, you know, people in my life are always like, you're the most magical person. Like I have friends who save me in their phone as a least magical manifester, like magical <laughs> manifester. And I have been touching on this with some people and I'm, I'm about to post a YouTube video about it. Um, but this this idea and belief that there, that future self that you can see and that just believing it actually allows you to make consistent action towards that. What happens is, you know, people say manifestation. All it means is um, alignment. It, it really just means things that are in your alignment, because if you're trying to manifest something, it's because you don't have it yet. The only things that you have are what come from the alignment of your being. So the experiences that you're getting are in alignment with your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs about yourself, and then how you take action. So when you want something that you don't have yet, it's because you have to become a different person and be in the alignment of those things. And to do that, you have to challenge your thoughts because your thoughts come yep. first and then your feelings and then your actions. So you have to challenge what it is you're telling yourself. If you desire something and you believe it to be true, you can challenge your thoughts that come up first. So if you desire something for me, I just, I just manifested an, an incredible move into the most beautiful home. And I've been manifesting this for months and it's been hard work, but I was telling myself these stories that, that kept me in lack, which is what was bringing me into my environment what I, I was worried instead of accepting everything that I have is already done. It's already been created. All I have to do is trust that. And then when my voice comes in and tells me like, you don't know how to deal with money. You, nobody's going to be looking for that. Then when I challenge that, that's the work. So that's the daily work that we do in manifestation is like, I am redirecting my path to be in alignment with the thing that I desire, right? Because if I desire it, I don't have it yet. So I have to challenge my beliefs, then put my emotions in the same um, place. So for me, I do it through visualization in the morning. I set my, that's that consistency. I set my eyes on the prize. That's what I want. But I allow myself to feel that I have it in the now. So how would I act if I was that person? How would I feel if I was that person? How would I, to me, it comes down to the values of my being and not necessarily what I want, although I can manifest that as well. But how does that person act? How do they move? How do they think? And then change those. And th that is the work because that is where your your stories of, of lack or that you can't have things that are bigger and better than you've ever could ever imagine it, that's where you make the consistent action. And by showing up with consistent action, your world will completely change, completely change because you're saying to the universe, I no longer accept these old experiences. They are not in my alignment. I'm looking for a different experience. And in the meantime, the universe is going to send you the opportunity to make the different choice. And you have to consistently make the different choice. This is what other people call tests. It's not a test. It's an opportunity. If you want to up level, show the universe. That's your opportunity. If you're given an opportunity and you show that you're not in alignment with that, then you're going to continue on the same path. And you are always subconsciously or consciously manifesting. You are all because that's you creating your reality. That's all it is, is you are getting feedback from you in verse universe. You're getting feedback. So the universe doesn't know if you judge something as good or bad. It just knows that this is what you're you're experiencing. So that's what you want to experience. So if you want to have a happier, healthier life and you see that version of you and you can feel it and you can trust that that's true, it's like, yes, I am recovered in my eating disorder. 
I have an online network and I'm helping people. You know what I mean? It's like, I go through all the things and then every day making that consistent action to manifest the life that we want. And anybody can do this for anything that they're looking to make changes for in their life. It takes all the five keys because those are the five keys of lasting change. And it takes you being consistent. Absolutely. Yep. Because if not, then you're just like you said, you're just going to keep going in those repeating patterns and you're just going to be keep getting the same things until you learn the lessons you need to learn or you make a change. So it's really, it's up to you. And that's one of the best lessons that you can learn in life to grow. I love that. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on. I am I really love getting to chat with you and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I'm so excited for you and I can't wait to hear more about your community and how it grows and all the wonderful things you're doing because you've made it your mission to serve people and to bring joy and to bring that feeling of life can be better. So I, I'm so proud of you and I'm so thankful to know you. So thank you so, so much. Yes. Thank you for having me on here for, you know, amplifying my voice in this community and for being such a support in my life. And I really appreciate, you know, like the workbooks, you know, you're like, this workbook has really helped me. And that allows that feedback for me. So you've always given me the feedback when I want to, you know, put something out and then say, okay, how can I do better? And I really love this, this grounded heart of gratitude that you have and this, this safe space that you have created here for us to have this conversation and for that conversation to then be shared and for you sharing your mission and your calling with me. Um, our alignment has been very beautiful. I feel very blessed to know you and I look forward to having this conversation again in a year when I have 50 people on the network and we're looking back and I, we can just talk more about the progress that has been made. I'm looking so forward to it. Absolutely. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So